So, this particular loop of Henle is responsible for maintenance of the corticomedullary gradient. If you take this gradient at the cortex, the gradient is around 300 milliosmoles, that is, the osmolality of the glomerular fluid at the level of the cortex or at the level of the tubules in the cortex it is around 300 milliosmoles. Now as we come down into the medulla the gradient is around 1200 milliosmoles. Now what is the structure which is responsible for maintenance of this corticomedullary gradient is your loop of Henle. Loop of Henle is responsible for maintaining the corticomedullary gradient. Now whatever this gradient is there why is this gradient happening this gradient remember it results from the absorption of water from the loop of Henle right it results from the absorption of water from the loop of Henle that is descending limb of loop of Henle and this descending limb of loop of Henle it is permeable to water and this gradient is also resulting from the reabsorption of salt in ascending limb of loop of Henle. Absorption of salt from ascending limb of loop of Henle. Whereas if you take the ascending limb of loop of Henle, that is the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle is impermeable to water. Alright. So, this loop of Henle is responsible for maintenance of this corticomedullary gradient. And this gradient, it is resulting from the reabsorption of water from the descending limb of loop of Henle and as well as the reabsorption of salt from the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. Now, what is the point that we have to discuss that here? The important MCQ here is the loop diuretics, right? This particular loop diuretics will abolish this corticomedullary gradient, right? The point what you need to remember is the loop diuretics abolish the corticomedullary gradient and as well as these loop diuretics will decrease the positive free water clearance and as well as they will also decrease the negative free water clearance. Right? They will decrease both positive free water clearance and as well as they decrease even the negative free water clearance. Right? And we have discussed what exactly you mean by free water clearance when we were discussing the thiazide diuretics. So free water clearance, the definition is the free water clearance, it is the amount of water which is excreted in the urine in excess of that required to excrete the solutes isoosmotically. This is what is called as free water clearance. And Remember, this free water clearance, this is, this free water clearance, this is positive for the dilute urine, right, this is positive for the dilute urine and this free water clearance, this is negative for the concentrated urine. Whereas this free water clearance, it is zero for the isotonic urine. For the isotonic urine. So, free water clearance is positive for dilute urine, negative for concentrated urine and it is zero for the isotonic urine. So, remember these loop diuretics, what are they doing? They are abolishing this corticomedullary gradient. So, by abolishing this corticomedullary gradient, they are decreasing the positive free water clearance and they are decreasing the negative free water clearance. Now, the other important action of this particular loop diuretics is, like as we have discussed the mechanism of action of this loop diuretics, loop diuretics, what do they do? They will inhibit the, they will inhibit the sodium potassium 2 chloride symporter. That is, they are inhibiting the sodium potassium. 2 chloride symporter. That means the reabsorption of sodium into the cells is being inhibited. Now this sodium 
whichever is not being inhibited right this particular sodium whichever is not being inhibited that is called unabsorbed sodium that will reach the distal tubules right that will reach the distal tubules now at the level of the distal tubules right at the level of the distal tubules remember this particular sodium it is being exchanged with the potassium right it is being exchanged with your potassium not only it is being exchanged with the potassium it is also being exchanged with the H plus ion right it is being exchanged with the potassium at the principal cells it is being exchanged with the H plus ion at the intercalated cells of your collecting duct all right so now remember this point here now when the sodium is being exchanged with the potassium and as well as H plus ion there is excess amount of the potassium loss and there is also loss of the H plus and this will result in what is called hypokalemia because once the potassium goes out then the individual will have hypokalemia now if the H plus ion is moving out H plus ion will give the acidity to our body so if the H plus ion is getting excreted out then the individual will have what is called alkalosis so they will have alkalosis and as well as a hypokalemia right they will have alkalosis and as well as hypokalemia now take one comparison point like we also had thiazide diuretics even thiazide diuretics also we have discussed that that will cause hypokalemia but the comparison point is you take the equivalent doses of loop diuretics and equivalent doses of your thiazide diuretics right equivalent doses of loop diuretics and equivalent doses of the thiazide diuretics remember at equivalent doses the loop diuretics they cause less hypokalemia than thiazide diuretics all right so loop diuretics they cause okay so that means I, what I want to tell you is the thiazide diuretics they cause more hypokalemia compared to that of the loop diuretics at the equivalent doses all right now so this is about like how this loop diuretics will cause hypokalemia and as well as alkalosis and remember another important point the main mechanism of action of the loop diuretics is mainly inhibiting the sodium potassium two chloride channels let me tell you these drugs are also a weak carbonic anhydrase inhibitors right these drugs are also weak carbonic anhydrase inhibitors now where was the site of action of the carbonic anhydrase inhibitor was being used if we just go back and see the carbonic anhydrase inhibitors that is your acetazolamide and as well as dorzolamide and brinzolamide we have seen that the action of those particular drugs is at the level of the proximal convoluted tubule all right but if you take the loop diuretics they also have the weak carbonic anhydrase inhibitor activity but the important point what you should remember this is an mcq point remember almost all your loop diuretics they will have this weak carbonic anhydrase inhibitory activity except ethacrinic acid all right except ethacrinic acid so this is an mcq point all right so remember except ethacrinic acid the remaining loop diuretics they will have a weak carbonic anhydrase inhibitory activity all right now let me tell you another important point about the loop diuretics remember the loop diuretics they will also change right they will also change intrarenal hemodynamics right they will also change intrarenal hemodynamics now what does that mean right they will also change the intrarenal hemodynamics what is that is these loop diuretics they also change intrarenal hemodynamics 
resulting in decreased reabsorption of sodium right decreased reabsorption of sodium and water in the proximal tubules right resulting in decreased reabsorption of sodium and water in the proximal tubules now let me tell you here is an important mcq point now the change in intrarenal hemodynamics by the loop diuretics at the level of the proximal tubule it is mediated by the release of the prostaglandins right this particular effect of the loop diuretics is mediated by the presence of the prostaglandins all right so that means these loop diuretics whenever they are acting at the various parts of the nephron they will change the intrarenal hemodynamics in what way by inhibiting or by decreasing the water reabsorption and as well as the sodium reabsorption from the proximal tubules and these changes are mediated by release of the prostaglandins the mcq point here is now because the prostaglandins are released there is a diuretic effect now which are the group of drugs which will reduce or which will attenuate the diuretic effect of the loop diuretics now remember the drugs which will inhibit the prostaglandin synthesis is your NSAIDs. Right? NSAIDs, they are basically the COX inhibitors. So, whenever they inhibit this particular COX enzyme, then there is no synthesis of your prostaglandins. Right? There is no release of the prostaglandins. So, under the effect of the NSAIDs, the diuretic effect of the loop diuretics is attenuated or reduced all right so this is a another important point about your loop diuretics next let me tell you another important point the loop diuretics they will not alter the gfr right the loop diuretics they will not alter the glomerular filtration rate now because they do not alter the glomerular filtration rate loop diuretics are the diuretics of choice in the presence of moderate to severe renal failure all right loop diuretics they will not alter the glomerular filtration rate so that is the reason why these particular drugs they are considered as drug of choice for moderate to severe renal failure right they are the drug of choice for moderate to severe renal failure now the another important point is if you see the furosemide furosemide it is having the vasodilatory action right furosemide it is having the vasodilatory action whenever you give this furosemide intravenously this vasodilatory action is responsible for the quick relief of symptoms in left ventricular failure now how does this happen now whenever you are giving the furosemide one it is having diuretic action so thereby the excess amount of the fluid whichever is the, there in the lung that is in the form of pulmonary edema will be completely washed out. And the other important point is this furosemide will cause very particularly venodilatation. Very particularly the venodilatation. So when furosemide is causing venodilatation remember what will happen is the venous return to the heart will reduce and thereby the cardiac workload will be reduced and thereby the fluid accumulation within the lungs will reduce. So, furosemide it is having vasodilatory action and that is responsible for quick relief of symptoms in left ventricular failure and pulmonary edema. Right? 
and pulmonary edema. All right. So this is one of the very important point about your furosemide. Now, if you take the another drug in the loop diuretics, what we have is bumetanide. Is bumetanide. Now you take this bumetanide. Remember, among all the loop diuretics, all right. Remember, among all the loop diuretics, the bumetanide is the most potent loop diuretic. This is an important MCQ, right? Bumetanide is the most potent loop diuretic, and the another important advantage of your bumetanide is. This is most potent loop diuretic and it is having lesser adverse effects compared to that of your furosemide. Right? It is having lesser adverse effects compared to that of your furosemide. This is about your bumetanide. Next, we have another drug called as ethacrylic acid. Right, we have another drug called ethacrylic acid. Remember, among all your loop diuretics, ethacrylic acid is highly ototoxic. Right, it is highly ototoxic with steep dose response curve. With steep dose response curve right so this is about your ethacrylic acid the important mcq is it is highly ototoxic next now we have another important mcq regarding a drug called torsamide right regarding a drug called torsamide among all the loop diuretics the torsamide it is having the longest half life Right, it is having the longest half life. This is an important point about your torsamide. Now, we have what is called mersalil, that is another important loop diuretic, and they are like organomercurials, they are not used now due to the risk of the kidney damage. Right, so we have another loop diuretics that is mersalil. This mersalil it is not used nowadays because of the risk of the kidney damage because of the risk of kidney damage so these are some of the important points about your the loop diuretics furosemide it is very much useful whenever you give intravenously in patients with the left ventricular failure and as well as pulmonary edema all right so they have these patients they have quick relief of the symptoms why is that due to because of the vasodilatory action of the furosemide and bumetanide among all the loop diuretics this is most potent and compared to the furosemide they, it has lesser adverse effects and you take ethacrylic acid among all your loop diuretics it is highly to ototoxic with steep dose response curve and you take torsamide among all the loop diuretics the torsamide it is having the longest half life and you take the mersalil this is also a loop diuretic but this is not being used nowadays why because it is having a risk of the kidney damage so these are some of the important points about the individual drugs